Right, hello, greetings. Um, <clears throat> so it's Dr. Tom Staffan here. And this is my last talk I'll be recording before bre Brexit happens. If it goes ahead, and it looks like it's going ahead on the 31st of January. Today is the 26th of January, so that's in five days' time. Like all the other people that have worked hard for Remain, or Bremain, as I call it, um, I lament this coming event. I think it's an absolute catastrophe. I've coined the phrase Brexitastrophe. This is a Brexitastrophe for all the liberal and progressive, <clears throat> intellectual, uh, working class, genuine, um, socially minded people in my country, Britain. Um, it's a disaster for people that love Scotland, that are voting for the SNP or that just love that country and want it to flourish and thrive in the UK in the UK, but also in the European Union, or independent from the UK. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a catastrophe for the Welsh, who um, realise that, that Wales needs to stay in the European Union. It's an absolute catastrophe for the people of Northern Ireland, um, who realise that it, <clears throat> well, it's the end of Northern Ireland. I mean, it's going to become part of the um, Irish Republic before long. Um, and of course, there are some people that really look forward to that. My fear is that that won't be accomplished peacefully. The whole thing is a nightmare of um, uncertainty and, and potential conflict flashpoints. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to um, really be commenting on how I see the coming period um, and what I think can be done from a philosophical perspective. Obviously, I'm an intellectual, I'm a druid, a Christian, a mystic, a scientist, um, an academic and a teacher. I'm also a sort of peace activist, so I'm talking from a variety of perspectives, variety of hats. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that something of what I say may resonate and that people may find it useful. I've actually just been back to the UK for a brief visit of four days. Uh, my, my first visit for about a year, actually. Um, I went to London and I went to Cambridge, mainly to see my three daughters. It was lovely to see them, friends, and um, to connect back up. I spent a day in the library of Cambridge University doing some research on political economy uh, <clears throat> that I'm going to share a bit later on in this talk that was very interesting and revealing. So thank you to the University of Cambridge <laughs> for letting me use your library and for letting my daughter study for her PhD there. Um, and it was great to be back in Cambridge, actually. Um, I did a talk when I was in London, which was recorded, which I will post to the internet. That was my last week's talk about Brexit. Um, I didn't film it because I didn't have a camera, but it will go on my blog or somewhere that carries audio <clears throat> stuff. And that talk was on the political economy of, of, of peace and, and opposing Brexit, really. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some of what I said there um, in this talk, but that went into more detail. <clears throat> Another thing that happened in this last week is when I was in London, um, staying with a friend who had Netflix, I was able to watch this documentary, The Great Hack. I've known about it. I've seen um, Democracy Now's interview with the filmmakers and with um, some of the people in it, and it I'd always wanted to watch it. So finally I watched it. I really, really recommend people that are listening to this to watch it. Um, go and see a friend with Netflix, or if you've got it yourself, watch it. Because to me it explained how Brexit won the vote. <clears throat> and um, really it should be seen, I mean it should be broadcast obviously on BBC, but it's never going to be, because the BBC is a kind of propagandistic arm of the Brexit government. <clears throat> it has been ever since Theresa May took office. Um, I've written to the Director General, well, the Chair of the Governors of the BBC, um, <clears throat> and I asked about who makes policy in the BBC. I got completely stonewall, not in the public interest to reveal this stuff. Not even under freedom of information, you can't be told that. So, um, obviously, somebody high up in the BBC, some committee, made a decision to back Brexit and to interpret the 2016 referendum as if that was a mandate for Brexit which is going to be like a hard Brexit now. Well, no, of course it wasn't. It was never anything of the kind. <clears throat> and an intelligent national broadcaster working in the national interest would have immediately flagged that up and, and had a plurality of conversations. Well, hey, the Scots didn't vote for Brexit. 
hey, the Northern Irish didn't vote for Brexit. Like, this is a catastrophe. What are we going to do? And we could have worked through some kind of national debate, discussion. That's what the BBC is for. My, um, one of my dear friends, um, far, uh, father, was um, Alvar Liddell, who worked for the BBC during World War II, was a friend of Churchill. He was the old school BBC. He was the newsreader who announced the um, progress of the war. And this is a time when America wasn't even helping Britain, don't forget. So much for America being a great ally. I mean, it's not. In World War II, it wasn't. For the first couple of years of World War I, it wasn't. Uh, for the first three years. And <clears throat> for large parts of the 19th century, it was actually a hostile force to the UK. Um, there's nothing in the USA genes that makes me trust it as an ally. On the contrary, it's um, always, um, you know... <clears throat> Uh, comes late to the party. And so for Britain to do Brexit and throw ourselves onto American largesse is, is about as intelligent as um, go to the moon without an oxygen mask. You know, it's completely bonkers. America as a country is set up for self-interest by law. And, um, and I have many, many dear American friends. This isn't because, you know, I'm anti-American. I love America. On the contrary, it's because I love America that I'm a realist. And I know that for Britain to leave its closest allies, the European Union members, and to throw itself into some sort of Atlantic fantasy is, is absolutely bonkers. Anyway, Alva Liddell, great BBC intellectual, um, you know, lived on and wrote and thought. And he was an Oxford-educated man. He was half Swedish, and his mother was a theosophist. He was interested in esoteric philosophy, and, and um, I didn't meet him. But, um, you know, that's the old school BBC that, that actually believes in truth and telling, you know, telling what's actually happening. He was the first BBC broadcaster, it was radio in those days, to actually sign off the news with his name, right? The first guy that would go public. Well, we've come a long way since then, unfortunately. And the BBC, I think, is partly to blame for this Brexit catastrophe we're facing. And I think it's absolutely shocking. The entire management should be sacked. The charter should be rewritten. A, they have to tell the truth. Um, <clears throat> you know, and what does the truth mean? Well, the truth is multidimensional, multi-complex. Ask a Jane what the truth is. The truth is seeing everything from all angles. Uh, that's what a true intellectually robust broadcasting service would do in the national interest. It would report all the views, all the interests of the entire population. What, what we did in interpreting Brexit was only take one narrow band of interpretation of that referendum and push it and push it and push it as if that's the consensus, which, which is turning that broadcast of the BBC into a lie machine. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, so no, you're not going to see the great hack on the BBC, sadly, until after a management shuffle. And by the way, I'm up for the running. I'll take the job as Director General. Yes, please, give me a ring, Tony. <laughs> um, but, you know, on condition that we rewrite the charter and make a truth-based thing. Um, <clears throat> in the sense that I'm describing. So then we have the great hack. Now, let me share, for those that haven't seen it, what I learned. It was incredibly important. Uh, it tells the story of how democracy has been changed beyond recognition by new technology. And it describes the advent of a particular company that was developing military advice for um, bodies like the MOD, the Pentagon, CIA, and all the rest of it. This, this particular body was British-based and made up of ex-army types, who basically were saying to the military, look, wars are costly, you don't need to fight wars, hire us, we'll change public opinion in the country, the target country, and we'll do it by infiltrating, penetrating social media, by spreading memes, by spreading ideas, and by spreading campaigns, and we'll do it in a targeted way, very intelligent, using software we've developed. So they developed a track record. They interfered in loads of countries doing this to change public opinion in favour of a British and American interests, right? <clears throat> and they then developed a data arm called Cambridge Analytica, which um, was a specialist in this, changing public opinion to the wishes of whoever's hiring the company. And they began to get very skilled at this. They also began to use Facebook as a tool and other social media so that they could, they discovered logarithms to hack into Facebook and download all the data without permission from the people, that's you and me that use Facebook, 
no permission granted or given. Um, <clears throat> and then we're able to compile very, very detailed profiles on all these people. And in the run-up to the American election, when Trump was elected, they were working behind the scenes to influence the persuadables by um, <clears throat> compiling all the data on... Actually, they have data on every single American citizen, every single voter. And they know if they're kind of left, right, liberal, centre, green, what's their political view, but also their emotional, psychological profile and so on. And then they targeted the persuadables with targeted um, adverts, which made the election swing in favour of Trump. So they, they basically hacked into the public mind of America to turn it for Trump. And this is all revealed in the documentary. You know, you have to see it. Brittany Kaiser was part of that campaign. And it's her revelation because she's discovered a bit late the horror of what she's done. She's now joined genuine Democrats like me who actually have concerned about the public welfare of this. They were hired also by the Brexit campaigning um, organisations. <clears throat> and um, they then also managed to use the same data to swing it for the Brexit campaign. And the details are still, you know, not fully revealed. The Cambridge Analytica went, it, it hid in liquidation rather than reveal its files and stuff. But what Brittany Kaiser and others have done is, is data dump the information. So we know what they were doing. And another uh, woman, Carol Cadwallader, figures heavily in this documentary. She reveals her several years of pursuit of Cambridge Analytica. Also helped by Chris Wiley, who again used to work for them and then realised what he was doing. Well, so basically what they do is based on the model, they've influenced elections in about 50 countries by now. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, although that company's gone, they're still doing it. They, they just reinvented a new name. Um, so, for instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, there was an election coming up. There are only two main parties in Trinidad. There's the Hindu party of Indian voters, Indian people, and there's the um, largely black Caribbean party that vote for black candidates. So it's a sort of racial divide. And Cambridge Analytica were hired by the Hindu Indian party to make sure they won the election. So they devised this clever strategy that's talked about in the documentary of persuading black voters not to vote. So they appeal to their disgruntledness with politics. Most people don't think politicians are worth voting for these days. So it wasn't too difficult to get them to to, to abstain. So they created this thing called the Say So campaign, which involved um, voters um, basically going around the streets of Trinidad saying, say so, meaning, and, and then you do a gesture with it. You cross your hands over your chest like this, which means I'm not voting. It's like, that's the symbol you do when you go out for the mass. If you're a non-communicant, you do that, and then the bishop gives you a blessing or the priest probably taken from that. So say so, no, I'm not, I'm not voting in this one. Now they targeted the black voters with that campaign and they got them creating say so dance bands and say so processions in the street. And it became a cult thing. Yeah, I'll join the say so movement. I'm not gonna vote. <clears throat> and this was all pioneered by Cambridge Analytica who, who were like infiltrating the mindscape of the Trinidad people, targeting the black voters so they won't vote. And lo and behold, a lot of them didn't. Lo and behold, the Hindu Indian Party won the election. So Cambridge Analytica pocketed a load of money and got lots of, you know, claps on the back. They'd won. Well, hang on. You know, I think that's totally and utterly wrong. That's manipulating democracy at a fundamentally invasive level that is to do with, like, George Orwell's worst nightmare. So interfering in how we think, right? Um, and the same team did the same in the Brexit election. They interfered in the mindset of the British people so that Brexit, Brexit, Brexit was pushed forward, Farage, 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 you know, hooray, hooray, Britain the best, you know, all the, all the ridiculous memes that were promoted, all of them lies. Now, the fact is, you see, Cambridge Analytica don't, don't care if it's lies or truth. They've invented the software and the mechanism to influence and infiltrate people's mindscapes so they can promote anything. They've now got so good at this and their successors that they can actually influence any election anywhere, I think, and persuade whoever to adopt whatever position, however ridiculous. Um, and I think that the same techniques, the same 
um, engines were being used in the last general election, which got this Conservative lot voted in, who any rational observer of British politics would not have voted for this lot. They're, they're cowboys, you know, completely uninterested in the future of the UK and just they're the Brexit fanatics um, pushing their way home <clears throat> over the line, as Johnson calls it. Well, you know, and it was, I think, again, skillfully engineered by these tinkerers in democracy. Well, this, I think, raises huge alarm bells. See the documentary. Um, legislation needs to be brought in immediately to prevent this in all future general elections, all future local elections. Generally, this has altered the, scape of, um, the landscape of democracy so that it's as if people can get into the ballot box and, you know, force you where you, where you put your hand by forcing your mindscape. <clears throat> now, so, okay, philosophically and technically, we need to think of a way to combat this. But you need to see the great hack to realise how Brexit was won. It was won by this fake industrial military espionage tool, which is what it is, in the interests of the people that were funding it. Okay, who's that? Let's back up a level. The other thing that the great hack reveals is that Russian um, <clears throat> engineers, software engineers and, and uh, interferers were also interfering in the Brexit referendum hugely on an industrial scale, pumping out anti um propaganda in order to persuade the British public to vote for Brexit. Why would Russia be doing that? Well, you know, I love Russians. I've got great friends who are Russian. I've been, um, you know, well known in Russian philosophical circles as a peace thinker. But I have to say Russia seems to have been taken over by some rather strange characters of late. I think it's the Russian geopolitical oligarchs who seem to have clustered around sort of slightly sinister nationalist elements in the Russian um, administration. <clears throat> and Putin doesn't seem to have the intelligence to stand up against them, or he's encouraging them, or he himself is just lacking in the moral intelligence that is needed. I don't know, because, you know, Lavrov as well has always struck me as an intelligent and moral thinker. I, I find it hard to believe that Lavrov signed off this kind of interference. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> It certainly suits Russia's long-term geopolitical um, ambitions that the UK be taken out of the European Union. And they may have made a calculated decision, yes, we'll throw everything we've got at this campaign because really we want the UK out of the European Union. What happens as a result of that is the UK itself breaks up. You know, Scottish and Irish independence, um, etc., etc., becomes a weakened force, busted flush. And that really suits Russian geopolitical interests because the UK has been pushing above its weight for many decades. It's been interfering in, in world affairs in a way that really annoys Russia. And so for Russia to be able to turn around and, and, and use <clears throat> nationalist, um, um, you know, um, sort of um, uh, resurgences to break up the UK for them is a very good karmic payback for the fact that the UK may well have been trying to do that against the old USSR. After all, the UK was heavily involved in the Afghan business, supporting the Afghans. Um, it's been heavily involved in uh, all kinds of skullduggery going on. And so the Russians probably felt legitimate about interfering in our elections. Um, <clears throat> then there's another factor which I'll come on to in a minute, which is uh, the Trump factor. But let me just say about the Russian question of legitimacy or not, um, I still don't think it is legitimate. And, and what the uh, documentary reveals is, yes, they were interfering in order to bring about Brexit. I think that's a miscalculation if Trump or Lavrov or anyone in Russia actually signed off on that. I think it's, a, a, it's an ethical error I don't think that um, it's within the purview of international states to interfere in the democratic processes in other countries. And this is why I proposed uh, a couple of years ago a cyber peace treaty which would outlaw such behaviour. So it would shut down things like Cambridge Analytica and their offspring from interfering in democratic choices in other countries. We should respect the sovereignty of nations. Now that sovereignty is to do with intellectual space. We have to respect the sovereignty of Iran, let them have a Shia government, let them have a whatever they want, respect the 
intellectual integrity of each each sort of mental construct, which we call a nation, and don't interfere with it by propagandistic uh, military-style information wars. What um, the great hack talks about is we've entered a new world of warfare. We're now into a world of information wars and communication wars. Well, I'm saying stop. <laughs> peace, people. We have to outlaw all this by cyber peace treaties. And I noticed that Lavrov actually proposed that in the UN General Assembly um, opening speeches. <clears throat> um, so either that was an incredibly cynical ploy, you know, he's proposing exactly the opposite of what they're doing, or he ge is genuine about it. I think he's genuine. I think, <clears throat> you know, um, there are many forces in Russia, but I think the real intellectuals that can think straight realise peace is the only way to go. But for that, we have to talk peace to Russia. And there needs to be an awful lot of, you know, um, mea culpa, because Britain has been playing a great game against Russia ever since the... 19th century in the Afghan wars, actually since the Crimean War. Um, <clears throat> and that's in spite of the fact that Russia has always been quite a good ally to Britain, turning up when, when you know, times are tough, um, going back to the Napoleonic Wars and, and so on. So look, um, okay, watch the great hack, incredibly important. I've just scratched the surface of what's there. But the implications of it is that the Brexit referendum of 2016 was was falsely won, illegally won, and won by interference by military uh, intelligence um, aficionados. Huge implications. Um, you see, the problem is the legal system hasn't yet realised we're in this world, and Parliament hasn't either. Parliament has not realised the seriousness of this, and I used to run seminars on philosophers um, discussing ethics and policy in Parliament. If I was in London, I still would be doing. And, you know, I would show the great hack, you know, in, in one of the committee rooms. We'd discuss it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. What's going on in Parliament? Where's the intellectuals? Is there anyone left? Um, you know, we, we've been taken over by a bunch of robots. Now I want to talk about the Trump impeachment because it's connected. I'm watching with interest as the Trump impeachment trial proceeds. I believe they need to call witnesses. They need to get to the absolute truth behind this Ukraine business. They will. Um, <clears throat> and if the truth comes out, then I think they will have to convict and, and Trump will have to be impeached. I noted that Craig Unger, a historian who I greatly respect for his work, the House of Bush, House of... Um, House of Bush, House of um, uh, Saud, which was published a few years um, <clears throat> ago, which exposed the connivance and collusion between the Bush dynasty and the um, Saudi dynasty in the events leading up to and just immediately after 9-11, <clears throat> and which formed the basis of Michael Moore's great documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, which pointed out to the absurd anomaly that... Um, Bin Laden was a Saudi citizen, and, and loads of people on the so-called plane of hijackers were, were um, <clears throat> you know, Saudis. And yet the American um, president let a plane with all these Saudi citizens, including relatives of Bin Laden, fly home a couple of days after 9-11. You know, how is this possible? Well, it's possible because the, the Saudi dynasty and the Trump dynasty had like very, very close overlapping interests. And it wasn't in the interests of the Bush dynasty that the Saudi role in 9-11 should come out. And so lots of documents were squashed and hushed and redacted. <clears throat> it was only much, much later, gradually, this information came out. And that came out with freedom of information requests and so on. And still to this day, it's all been hushed up. The extent of Saudi involvement in 9-11 and what's called the higher level of operation behind 9-11, who was actually in the loop, um, because it certainly wasn't just Al-Qaeda and, you know, 19 um, frontline martyrs led by bin Laden. <clears throat> no, it was, it was uh, there were levels of this conspiracy that were much higher up, and the Saudis and other elements of the Bush dynasty and so on were involved. So anyway, Craig Ungar exposed all, well, he didn't expose it all, he began the conversation, right? He's just written a book, which is a sequel, called House of Putin and House of Trump, with 10 years of solid research behind it, in which he's exposed a similar overlapping network of interests between Trump and his entourage, 
and Putin and his entourage of Russian oligarchs and essentially what a Russian mafia. Extremely wealthy people, ruthless, armed, dangerous, uh, very clever, you know. Um, <clears throat> and basically Trump has been a, a lackey for them. His business career has been helped by them. Ungar gives information about, you know, brown envelopes appearing in, in, in Florida and whatever. I mean, Trump is up to his neck. He's like a stool pigeon for the Russian mafia who's managed to hack into the White House and to create, again, using these militarized um, conspiratorial um, you know, data warfare systems, um, a kind of, this kind of meme that Trump is the great patriot, the great nationalist hero for the American people. Um, <clears throat> you know, shocking, really. Um, so, so... This, this explains why Trump has also been supporting Brexit. If you join these dots up, Trump has been put in place there, it seems, by the Russians in order to, to do as much damage as he can to American and Western interests before he's finally forced from office. You know, it's probably going to be through impeachment. Um, and why is he doing this damage? Well, obviously, because it suits his masters in, in Moscow. It suits the Russian oligarchs that are trying to run the world. Um, and they want to, um, you know, do as much damage as they can. So breaking up Britain is a masterpiece, uh, supported by Trump, which in turn is supported by their higher-up masters. Why is it supported? Because it damages the EU at a fundamental level. It's like an amputation. It's like taking the left arm off the EU or the right arm. Britain is really important to us in Europe. I'm British, but I'm also European. I don't want Britain to leave Europe. I don't want Britain to break up. I want it to stay together and I want it to stay in the European Union. That is in our interests, it's in Europe's interests, it's in the UK's interests, it's in my country's interest. It's in my Canadian country's interest, my I'm dual citizen. It's in the interest of the Commonwealth. It's in the interest of everyone that thinks this through. It's not in the interests, apparently, of Russia and the people that Russia's put into power in America. No, they want the Europe to break up. They want the EU to have this amputation. They want the UK to go down the tubes. Uh, so the Trump impeachment is incredibly important. Watch it. Follow it. Um, <clears throat> and the um, right-wing media running the Trump campaign and so on are going to throw everything they can at this and try and say, no, 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 it's all lies. You know, um, It's not. Watch the great hack. Realise what's going on here behind the scenes. Join up the dots. Um, <clears throat> and I'm saying this as a great lover of Russian culture. You know, I'm a great lover of Russian philosophy. I've studied it. I've taught it. I've been to Moscow. I've spoken at the Institute of Philosophy there. I know many Russian philosophers. I have a great respect for the Russian philosophical tradition. What, what they've been doing here is, is not in the interests of Russia itself. Um, and, and it's not in the interests of the real interests of, of a democratic Russia or an intellectual Russia. You know, I'm, I'm with the, the uh, Decembrists, the genuine progressive forces in European and Russian society that opposed autocracy and opposed the dictatorial rule of the Tsar and so on. Kerensky and the first revolution was, was progress. My, uh, one of my tutors at the School of Symbolic and East European Studies, Jeffrey Hosking, wrote a book on the Duma and the democratic process in Russia. He's an expert on Russian intellectual history and poetry and literature. You know, the great Russians are for freedom and, and liberalism in the best sense of the term. Unfortunately, Putin has hacked, hijacked the country and created this meme that liberalism is something dark and evil and sinister. And a lot of the propaganda that's pumped out from Russia is anti-liberal. Um, you know, and the attacks on Joe Swinson, for instance, that joined the last election, a lot of that was coming from Russia, I can assure you. Um, because Putin hates liberalism. He thinks it's an evil thing. Bless him. He doesn't understand it. He's never read Gladstone. He's never been to St. Daniel's Library like I have. He's never, obviously, read Montesquieu. He's never understood Voltaire. He's never, he's never sat in the, you know, the Grand Orient in Paris and realised that, hang on, you know, these people gave their lives for the freedom of of French intellectuals, the, the importance of freedom of speech, what I'm doing here is premised on the liberal victories. Um, <clears throat> one of the great philosophers of Germany, uh, Feuerbach, who influenced 
um, Marx, um, his father wrote the first penal code for Bavaria when it was a separate country, Elder Feuerbach, um, and he abolished torture in Bavaria, right? This is what liberalism is. It's like, you can't just arrest me and torture me because you don't like what I say. That is so fundamental that to be against it, as Putin apparently is and his lackeys, is very sinister. Um, you know, um, so I think liberalism has to fight back using the mechanisms at our behest, which is the, the free media, the free press, the circulation of ideas. In, in old Solzhenitsyn's time, it was the Samizdat. I had to secretly write speeches in the Tsar's Iran. It was, it was audio tapes smuggled in from Paris by Khomeini. You know, we might be going back to those days again soon. I hope not, because that's why the European Union is so important. It guarantees our freedom of, of assembly, of thought, of speech. You know, there's a whole rights in built into that. The UK constitution is hijackable. It can be turned into a fascist dictatorship, you know, like that, as we're seeing. Um, and, of course, it will never say that. It will just pretend, oh, no, 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 we're just, you know, the Brexit mafia. Well, who's running them? Who's really running the Boris Johnson Conservative Party? Why won't they release the Russian um, intelligence report? Well, obviously, because they would have lost the last election. And they would probably be forced from office as an unconstitutional, treasonable party. I still think the Conservative Party are an unconstitutional, treasonable party. Um, and we're watching a coup in slow motion, of which Brexit is the fundamental you know, um, action. Well... Sorry, you know, it's not going to happen on my watch. Um, I'm with Feuerbach, and Marx called him the fiery brook through which anyone that's interested in philosophy has to pass. Well, Marx doesn't ever talk about, you know, Feuerbach had a brother who was also a great philosopher, actually, and he had a father who was a legalist and, and wrote the penal code for Bavaria that outlawed torture and brought in rights for people. So I'm with, I'm with that tradition in the European context, and Poor old Russia, you know, I don't know. It seems that in today's Russia, if you say the wrong thing, you get shot or you get acid thrown at you. I mean, this isn't good enough, folks. I mean, I love Russia. I love Russians. Please get your act together and stop interfering in, in genuine democracies. Because, um, you know, we know what you're doing, right? So Trump, yeah, go down, sir. You should go to prison. You've been very naughty boy. <laughs> You know, you're very naughty. Go to prison, mate. You've been back in the wrong side. You're with the devils here. Okay, let's talk about the Queen, talking about the devils. What on earth is the Queen doing? I spoke to her on the phone recently, um, and uh, we had a long chat, you know, um, <clears throat> and I have met her. I always thought she was a good, honourable, decent person. Um, but she's gone and signed the assent bill to the thing that's destroying my rights as a European citizen. Well, that's in spite of the fact that the Scottish Assembly, the Irish Assembly and the Welsh Assembly all voted against this Brexit bill. So the Queen has gone against the wishes of three of the four countries over which she presides in order to implement the whim of the largely English Parliament. 80% of the MPs in the Parliament are English voters uh, voting them in to thrust Brexit down the route of these other countries that are against it. Well, the Queen says, no, I've no, I've no choice, I have to sign it. Sorry, ma'am, you don't, you shouldn't have done. You should have said, this is a constitutional crisis, make a Queen's speech saying, I can't sign this, I want you all to agree a common position, you know, and have a second referendum. And if I'd been the King, I would have threatened to abdicate unless that, that common sense position was upheld. Uh, <clears throat> but no, I don't know, I suspect, as I've said before, and I'm not saying anything really that you can't work out for yourself. I think the Queen is compromised by some intelligence that the Americans or Russians or, who, or both or Israel or somebody has against the royal family in the archives, something that the Queen has personally done or been implicated in. Um, and that